can sit down, but for just a second. Good morning. There is nothing better than being here. This much I'm going to assume about you. You are not here this morning because you had absolutely nothing else to do at 9.30 on a Sunday morning, a beautiful Sunday morning. You are here because we get this privilege of coming into this presence of this wide open God who radically, irrationally invites us into his relationship. And that means into an adventure. And every single day is an adventure in him. And we come to celebrate that. Guys, real, real quick, um, just so you are aware, we got a couple minor things to let you know about. Um, first of all, there are a few tickets left for our birthday luncheon. They are in sale on sale in the uh, fellowship hall. Also, the, for the next month, we're collecting gently used shoes uh, to help out the uh, Next Step mission and help out uh, the needy through that. Also, on Mother's Day, the youth group is going to be doing a, uh, a yeah geranium sale. Six bucks, right? Four for twenty. I think that's what we just said. So there's the deal. And that's going to help out their mission trip. You're going to be hearing a little bit more about in a couple minutes. And guys, there's a lot of other stuff, great stuff coming up. We are not slowing down an inch because here's the thing. We are called on purpose for a purpose. Not to be a bunch of nice people who happen to flatten themselves into the same bit of geography on Sunday morning. We are called to be the family the voice of Jesus Christ. We got a mission, we got a job, and we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. It begins here and now as we stand up, turn around, greet one another in the name of Christ. Hey! 
And after that one, I can say, man, you can all go home not so lucky. Actually, there is one thing I did forget to mention in that first little bit, brief bit of announcements I don't want to neglect, and that is next Sunday, we are reaching out into our community again. And uh, at 1 o'clock, we're going to be doing a memorial for a deer. Yeah, I know that sounds weird, but we're going to do it. We're going to minister to some hurting people. And then, right after that, we're going to be doing a pet blessing. So everybody is welcome to come, bring your pets, bring every, you know, you bring your dogs, your cats, please leave the snakes at home. That's all I ask. But you know what, guys, here's the thing. We're living out this adventure. We're living out an adventure in Jesus Christ. And that means something real practical and really pragmatic. And here's a great thing. we got a youth group where hearts are being turned. And we got a youth group that is doing exactly that. And this summer, this is our moment for missions, guys. This summer, they're going to be taking a missions trip down south. And we'd invite them to come up and talk about that. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Jules, come on up. Everybody, I want to introduce you to Jules. She is one of our members that is going to be going on our mission trip with us. We have 24 that are going to be going to our mission trip this year. Um, and we are going to Alabama. We are actually going to Bayou Labatre, Alabama. Um, but we're from now on, we're going to talk about it as the Bayou because uh, we get a little tongue twisted when we say Bayou Labatre. So I'm going to leave it to Jules. Hi, everyone. My name is Jules. And I'm here to talk to you about something that's really close to my heart. The mission trip is to the Bayou, Alabama. I know it might sound just like another trip, but trust me, it's so much more than that. As a follower of Christ, I believe that this journey is about helping others. It's about answering God's call to serve and to love one another as he has loved us. First off, going to the Bayou opens our eyes to the struggles and hardships faced by our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ as well as those who, that may not know him yet. It's easy to get caught up in our own lives and forget that there are people out there who need our help and prayers. By immersing ourselves into the community, we can show them the love and compassion that Jesus taught us. Secondly, this trip gives us the chance to live out our faith in a real and tangible way. We're not going to talk about being Christians. We're putting our faith into action by serving those in need. Whether it's rebuilding homes, feeding the hungry, or comforting the brokenhearted, we're following the footsteps of Jesus and spreading his message and hope and redemption. More, moreover, going to the bayou helps us grow closer to God and deepen our relationship with him. Away from the distractions of our everyday lives, we have the opportunity to spend time in prayer, worship, and reflection. We can listen to God's voice speaking to our hearts and guiding us on the path he has planned for us. And let's not forget about the friendship and the bonds that will form along the way. There's something special about serving alongside other believers who share our faith and values. We'll encourage and support each other, laugh together, and maybe even shed a few tears together. These shared experiences will strengthen our faith and remind us that we're not alone in our journey. In conclusion, the mission trip to the Bayou isn't just a fun time away for us teenagers. It's essential for our spiritual growth and development as Christians. Through service, faith, and fellowship, we can make a real difference in the lives of others and bring glory to God's name. Thank you for listening to me talk today and learning a little bit about what we're experiencing on our trip to the bayou. Please pray for us on our journey, and if you are called, please prayerfully consider helping us financially to get to our destination. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there we go. How many of you have ever stood up in front of the 930 service and talked about something before? <laughs> That's tough. There's only a few of you that raised your hand. How many of you have ever gone on a mission trip to a place that you've never been to? A few of us, right? Is it easy? It's not easy to stand up in here, especially at 930, because we got a lot of people here at 930. Um, but it's also difficult to go to a place that you've never been to and to do some of the things that are asked of you while you're there, especially as a young person. Um, so we've got 24 people who are going, um, and we are going to be serving the people of a community that we've never been to, um, people that we've never met. And we don't know if they know who Jesus is, if they don't know who Jesus is, but we are going to 
be the light of Christ, to be the reflection of Christ, so that when they see us, they see who he is. Um, and today is Moment for Missions. That's why we're up here talking. Um, and we're trying to raise funds to get down to Alabama. So if you would like to, any loose change that you have that you put in the offering plates, um, or if you'd like to give anything else, just write that on the envelope or on your check. That would be wonderful. Um, we are working very hard to get there um, with just excitement and love so that we can continue to share Christ and what we're doing here at this church with other people in a different place and building relationships along the way. So we very much appreciate your support, as always, the things that you do for us. Um, we're also doing a geranium sale, and we're going to be selling pet items at the uh, Pet Blessing next week. So please come and enjoy that as well. Thanks, everybody. How cool is that? How cool is that? we got 20 young people, four adults, but 20 young people are going to take a week of their lives in the middle of summer vacation to go someplace hot, to get dirty and messy and tired, I promise, serving Jesus Christ. How cool is that? And I'm excited to be a part of a church that would do that. And you know what? They're doing that because that's their job in Christ, and they need support, and that's our job in Christ. We're going to praise God that he's going to liberate the funds to be able to make that happen. Not because we got to. Not because we're obligated to, because we get to. We get to give on that kind of a level. That's what this moment is. Moment of offering. It truly, truly is not a you got to. This is all about what we get to do in Jesus Christ. Share with him as he gave absolutely everything for us. As our ushers come forward, let's pray for a second. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are all about faithfulness and you are all about provision and you came all the way to a cross to provide for us. So Lord, it's a privilege that we get to give what you what we have to make a sacrifice for you so that your message can be spread and your kingdom can be built. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. While we're doing that, part of loving and supporting him is loving and supporting one another. And uh, as we lift one another up in prayer, and a couple names want to hold up to you guys. We've been praying for Alan Bateman. Continue to pray for him, please, as he continues to struggle for months now with a bleeding leg wound. He's in uh, community stroke and rehab right now. And still bleeding. And so please, let's be praying for him and his wife, Jean. Also for Ina Lindsay of our congregation, 100 years old. And uh, nearing the end of this life and the beginning of another. For Bethel Griffin, who's turning 91 this week, I believe it is. And she's in rehab, hoping to get out. Um, also for Gladys Schleeman of our congregation. She had her 88th birthday. Her party is today, and she was in the ER yesterday. They think she's going to be able to make it. We need to pray her into this party, guys. We really, really need to do. And then one other, and, and boy, this one's tough. i got to tell you, this one's tough. Been here almost 17 years now. And one of the things is that there are, you guys suck me in. You really do. And uh, one of the dear, incredible people in this congregation, Peg Chesner of our congregation, passed on into God's glory this week. And we're going to be celebrating her life this Wednesday at 11 o'clock at a service here. Incredibly cool lady who, by the way, told some of the best jokes I've ever heard. I just got to say. So heaven, heaven got a great deal when they got her. Other things we need to be aware of, guys. Other things we need to be praying for. Yeah. All right, your mom finished her fourth round of chemo out of 12, and the PET scan is clear. <laughs> Praise be to God. That's so cool. Other things we need to be aware of. Yeah. I have an update on mom. She went to the cardiologist Friday, and they think it's a low blood pressure issue that was making her kind of black out. Okay. So Okay. All right, so mom, we're praying for you because they diagnosed her with a low blood pressure problem. They're going to do an echocardiogram, but they've also given her some meds. So with you as her daughter, I'm surprised it's low blood pressure. Can I just say that? Anyway, no, I'm sorry. I love you. You know that. 
If there's anything else, in the far back. All right, for Stephanie, who's due any day, going to be your fourth grandchild. That's, that's incredible. It is incredible. So that's great. If there's nothing else. Let's be praying, guys. Let's pray. Almighty, all-merciful God, who in Jesus stretched out your arms wide to a broken world and to broken people like us, Come into your presence, Lord, not because we deserve to or because we have our act together, but because you have a heart for broken, struggling, doubting people just like us. So come into your presence and we lean into your forgiveness, into your hope, into your joy, Lord. We give you all of us, all of our needs and the needs of the people around us. Sometimes those needs are physical, Lord, and we, they need your physical healing. We pray for that. Sometimes it's emotional or spiritual. Sometimes it's mourning and missing somebody they love. But, Lord, in all of that, enter in with your peace and your joy and your love. But more than that, Lord, use us to enter into that moment with your heart and your word in our mouth and your work in our hands, Lord. Lord, we give you our community and our nation. And we pray for healing for our nation, Lord. We pray for softer hearts. We pray for justice. We pray for mercy. And Lord, bind us together as you can, only you can. Not in a way that politics never will or social debate never will. You bind us together in your love. Lord, we thank you for our heroes, our first responders, our teachers, our medical staff, Lord, all those who go above and beyond. And we ask your wisdom and your strength on them. We pray this day for those elected office, both sides of the aisle. Bless them, Lord, and give them your wisdom. We give you your world, and we hear with horror about what's going on between Iran and, Egypt, or, and Israel, Lord and what's going on in the Ukraine, what's going on in Gaza, and what's going on all over the world. And our hearts cry out for your peace, for your hope. Lord, we pray for all your children who are in danger, all of those who are in need, all those living under war or terrorism. We pray for the terrorists. We pray for the hearts that hate. And we ask that your love would change them, Lord. Lord, we give into your care those in our armed services all over the world. And Lord, bless them and keep them safe and bring them home, Lord, to their families that wait. Lord, we give you your church all over the world and we thank you for this incredible place, First Methodist. Lord, just fire us up. Fire us up to live out this adventure, this joy that you have for us every single day. Lord, it's not about us being successful in the world's terms. It's about us being faithful to who you've created us to be. So, Lord, fire us up and let us loose to do some serious damage for your kingdom in this world, Lord. Fire us up and let us loose to build your kingdom in these walls and out there in that community, Lord. And now in the quietness of this moment, we lift up to your own individual needs. Hear us, we pray. All these things we ask you. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. The one who, when we ask, taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven,
We have two scriptures today, and they kind of bracket the, the life or the ministry of Jesus. Because one belongs very early on in his ministry, where he does something, and again, it's one of those things where we kind of listen to him and say, oh, that's nice. But there are some mic drop moments in this story. A reading from the ninth chapter of Matthew. As Jesus, he has just landed in Capernaum, and as he passed on from there, he saw a man Nate called Matthew sitting in a tax office. I've talked about this before. Read Major League Schmuck here, okay? He is a traitor, he's a thief, he's a rip-off artist, he's a con artist. Sitting in the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. As he sat at the table in the house, Matthew's house, he goes to his house, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why Pharisees, by the way, read religious folks, okay? The religious folks said, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why is he hanging with exactly the wrong crowd? And when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Because the sacrifice was the rules. The sacrifice was the way you, you bought God's favor, okay? For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Our second reading comes from the other end of the book of Matthew. And this is going to sound like leftovers, folks, but man, this is not just a story they repeat. This is the story. After the Sabbath, the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that, that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, don't be afraid. I get it. I know who you're looking for, Jesus. He was crucified. He isn't here. He is arisen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message to you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray for a second. Heavenly Father, in the next few minutes, just strip away all the voices in our heads. Keep us out of sermon glide, Lord, that we can hear the radical, rest, reckless call that you have for our lives and that we may follow you into the adventure that you have. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. One more time. Good morning, everybody. So, you know, I know you heard that scripture and you said, okay, I was here three weeks ago, I get it, let's move on, right? But here's the thing, the fact that the stone was rolled away, that is this fundamental fact, the, the fundamental event of our whole lives, the fundamental, this, this one event changed all of history, it changed the whole world, everything was changed by the fact that the stone was rolled away. And here's the thing, we hear it and we say, that's nice, I remember that story, but the truth is it's radical. It's life-changing. It's world-changing, or at least it ought to be, even if it's just my world, even if it's just our world. Because God does something totally radical, totally unexpected, totally reckless. He throws open the door and invites the whole world into relationship. He invites the whole world into joy. He invites the whole world to new life. Not just getting through the week, but really for truly being alive. Here's the thing, on the cross, Jesus makes a wide open invitation to a broken world. Everybody's welcome, come just as you are, and the admission is paid. In case you miss it, that's a mic drop. That is this radical, reckless invitation. Hey, this is an all skate. This is an all skate. Everybody's welcome. 
come just exactly as you are, messed up, jacked up, doubting, confused, wherever you are in this moment, come just as you are. And by the way, your admission for a relationship with God, I already paid it. It's not about what you do. It's about the admission that I paid. That's radical stuff. At the empty tomb, God rolls away anything that can keep us from him almost. In the moment that Jesus is crucified, the moment that stone is rolled away, the curtain is ripped, and God comes flooding out of that tomb in power, in strength, in joy, and changes everything. And all of the yabbits, all of the yabbits, yeah, I know he rose, yeah, but this, yeah, but I'm not good enough, yeah, but I wasn't this, you know, yeah, but you don't know my past. God sweeps all of those away, and nothing can keep us from that relationship except us. Okay? Except us. And yet here's the ironic and really sad thing, guys. And this is what I want you to know. No sooner did God roll away that stone, but in the centuries that followed, the church has been trying to roll the stone back ever since. God goes to the trouble of sending an angel to unroll the, the stone, and man, we, we got busy as soon as that angel left. We've been trying to roll it back to keep Jesus in, to keep Jesus where he's safe, to keep Jesus where he's predictable, and to keep people not like us out. We've been trying to take this radical gift that God paid everything to give us, and we make it complicated. We make it complicated, you know? God's offer on the cross is simply this. Jesus plus the cross equals salvation. Romans says, all who call upon the name of Jesus will be saved. So he says, you know what? Everybody's welcome. Everybody is welcome. And we say, yeah, except that. You know, except that. You got to do this too. We want to say Jesus plus the cross plus X, right? And X is, but you got to read out of the right version of the Bible. Or you got to be baptized, or you got to be baptized the right way, and you got to, you know, you got to use the right words, and you got to pray the right way, and you got to think the right way, and you got to look a little bit like us and believe like us, and you know, you got to do all this stuff. And we made it so much harder. I got to believe God shakes his hand and says, You don't get it. You don't get it. Jesus, my gift on the cross equals salvation. Get rid of the X. Get rid of anything you add to that. Not only does it make the cross not work, it makes it dreary. It makes it serious and somber. We try to make it about what we do rather than about what he's done. Because it's all about worshiping right and singing right, right, you know? And, and, it, and it's all about praying right. And it's about us doing the right things in the right way. No, God says it's nothing about you. It's never been about you. It's only about what I have done. In the process, we've re-rolled the stone. We kept the world out. We have taken this radical, reckless invitation in. And, and, and we've made it all about us. And we try to keep the world out. We try to seal Jesus in that tomb where he could be comfortable and predictable. And we keep the world out. Jesus, before he ascends, has a different idea. He said to them, go into, what's those next three words, folks? All, what, what are they? All the world. That means the radical, that's a radical invitation, that word All. That means to people who don't have their act together, people who doubt, people who are doing things they shouldn't do, people who are broken, people who may not even know that they need that invitation yet. He says, go into their lives and unroll the stone. And we didn't waste any time doing it. This is, this is sad and hilarious to me, but we know about what happens in the church after Jesus created it. And this is great. This is so human. Jesus is crucified. Jesus rises, right? He says, go into all the world, preach it to everybody. And no sooner did he go away than Peter, right? You know Peter? 
foot and mouth disease. I love him. We know from the book of Acts, he says, you know what? I got it. I got it. I understand this. Jesus plus salvation plus being Jewish. He says, you know what? Jesus plus salvation plus you got to follow all the rules. And you got and you got to follow all the festivals. By the way, there's 670 some rules, okay? And you got to be circumcised. We won't go into that one, okay? And and you got to do all this extra stuff. Jesus plus the cross plus do all this stuff and you can have salvation. And whether you realize it's nice he's rerolling the stone. Paul in Galatians says, here's the thing. In Jesus, the anointed, whether you're circumcised or not, makes no difference. What makes the difference is your heart. What makes the difference is your relationship. What makes your di- the difference is faith powered by love. And you know what? Ever since then, we've been trying our very best to re-roll that s- stone and it seems like every denomination or every church is, has the right answer, right? And you know what? It's all about us. And we're writer. we got to be writer than everybody else does, you know? The reality is we've been re-rolling the stones ever since. And the world has been locked out. We re-roll the stone when we make it all, uh, make it all more about us and less about him and them. There is this term that I hate, especially when I hear myself say it, and I do this on occasion. At least I hate it in one sense. And the term is simply my church, right? You know, I hear myself say, well, in my church, my church. And you know what, guys? I love it. If if you are one of those who claim this church, we love that, and I'm glad you have a buy-in. But here's the thing. If it's my church, then it needs to be a reflection of me. It needs to be what I want it to be or what you want it to be or what we decide it's going to be and what's going to be best for us and what's going to serve us best and what's, you know, and it's going to be this sort of all about us kind of thing. Here's the deal. This whole thing about my church, I don't get one of those. You don't get one of those. This is not our church. Don't tell the district superintendent here when she's here next week, but this isn't the United Methodist Church. This, is, this church is about Jesus Christ, crucified and raised. This is his church. We are here because he brought us into it. And we need to be all about that and all about them. And by the way, because he, he says time and again, if you want to serve me, serve somebody else. Jesus says, if you want to serve me, serve the least of these. Whatever you do for them, you're doing for me. It's not our church. It's never been about us. It's about Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ can do in this amazing place through us. Go back, you're going to read this several times, but the end of that story when the religious people says, why is he hanging with all the wrong crowd, you know? Why is he hanging with those kind of people? He says, you know what? That's why I've come. Because the people who have their act together, and we don't, they don't need me. I've said this before, guys. If your faith is perfect, without doubt or blemish, if your character is absolutely perfect, guys, the door's back there because we got nothing to offer you here at First Methodist, okay? But you know what? He says, that isn't who I came for. I came for the people whose lives are messed up a little bit. And the people who struggle and have difficult relationships and the people who doubt sometimes and the people who maybe aren't as always as faithful as they want to be, those are the people that I have come for. We re-roll the stone when we take this message of reckless love and we make it religious. And in case you're wondering, that's a bad thing. Because religions, all religions, to some degree, are about the rules. And different religions come along and they give you new rules or better rules or different rules. But make no mistake, it's all about the rules. Well, you know what? Rules can be okay. They can be guidelines in our life. But the problem of it is we apply those to our relationship with God and it becomes all about what we do. Jesus came and he broke those rules. He ate with sinners. He healed on the Sabbath. He does all of this stuff that doesn't meet the rules. And we've been trying to make it religious ever since. 
We try to lay our own stuff on there, you know? How many times are you baptized? Whether you're baptized in the right way, are you, are you saying this, are you doing this, you know? It's all about the rules. Real quick story. Um, it, it's, it's funny to me how we do this. A number of years ago, I was first starting out in ministry, I was in a little church uh, behind Lakes of the Four Seasons. And we were just looking for something to do, so we come up with something dumb. We we're going to do an adult sock hop, okay, in the basement. And the, this, this lady named Anna called me up and she said, I read about this sock hop. I said, yeah. She said, there's not going to be dancing, will there? And I said, well, if you look at the name, I'm thinking maybe. She said, you can't do that. I said, why not? She said, it's, it's against the rules. I said, well, you know what? The Methodist church dropped their, their problem with dancing about 100 years ago. No, it's against the rules. I said, well, there's nothing in our guidelines that says we can't do that. It's against the rules. Finally, I said, where are the rules? She said, I have no idea, but if you find them, this is against it. Man, not all of them are that silly, but we make it about the rules, you know? And, 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 and should I always love this. Should we receive communion? And, and who can receive communion? Or who can be baptized? Or all of this. We try to re-roll that stone. That's what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees existed in this time where it was all about Jewish law. And there was more than 600. And by the way, they kept on inventing more and more rules to please God. Jesus said, you're hopeless. You load people down with rules and regulations, not near, uh, nearly breaking their backs, but you don't even help them. He says it's not about the rules, it's not about the religion, it's about a radical faith, trust, and relationship with me. At the end of that time when he was questioned after being with Matthew, he says to the religious people, you want to know what I want? I want mercy. Not the sacrifice, because the sacrifice was about the rules. The sacrifice was about the religion. He says, I want your heart. We re-roll the stone when we bend Jesus to look just like us. And we're all pretty good at this, don't we? I mean, let's be honest. I want a Jesus who's going to look like me, who's going to agree with me, who's going to think like I think, right? Probably, by the way, vote the way I vote, okay? I'm about to get into trouble here. But a couple weeks ago, I was driving down the road, and all of a sudden, I saw a bumper sticker on a car in front of me that said, Jesus is a li was a liberal. Really? I didn't know he voted. And then the other side of the thing, did you see the social Facebook, uh, the social statement that was put out that Donald Trump was ordained by God to be elected again? Wow, I didn't know God voted. You know what, guys? God isn't a conservative or a liberal. God has this annoying habit of being God. And claiming our heart. You know what? It's not about us making God into our image. It's about us falling down in worship and awe to this God who is who he wants to be. It was that way from the very beginning. The angel says, way back, we're going to go back to Christmas. I bring you good news of great joy which will come What's those last four words? To all the people, the ones who don't like, don't like what you like, the ones who disagree with you, the ones that you wouldn't want to sit with, that's who Jesus came to claim. We re-roll the stone when we demand people meet us where we're at instead of meeting them where they are. You know what? If you want to come here, you better have your act together. Or if you don't, you better get there pretty quick, right? You're here so that you can become like us. Do me a favor, look around. Go look around, you had pivots, guys. You know what you're not seeing? You're not seeing a congregation of people who used to be like you are. You're not seeing a bunch of people who have recovered from being who you are. You're seeing a bunch of people just like you. Just like a whole broken world. And you know what? It's not about us getting people. Christ can change lives, and Christ can radically do amazing things, but it begins, it begins with meeting people where they are. When they, I love there's an answer to this question. When they said to, to, to Jesus, or when they said to the disciples, why does your teacher act with, uh, eat with tax collectors and sinners? Real simple, because he showed up at their house. When he, when, he, when he comes to Matthew, 
He says, you know what? You're going to go amazing places. You're going to write a book, dude. You're going to be able to be a gospel writer. But it's going to start when I come to your house. Because before I can, you can follow me, I need to meet you where you are. We re-roll the stone when we care more about our dignity than we do about making a difference. And can I just say, this is me, I take great joy in this because, guys, let's be honest here, we're family, right? Not everything we do is really dignified here, okay? You know what I'm saying? I was reminded this week, somebody actually had a photograph that they wouldn't destroy of me dancing in a grass skirt to make $500 for a missions project, okay? That's one I would rather leave buried. But we do weird stuff. We stage fake Packers protests. And by the way, fool the Chicago Tribune. Why? So that we can get people to come to a Bears and Badges event so that the fire department now has enough, is going to have enough money to equip every fire vehicle in AED, which means people who are dying are going to live because of that. We're, we're going to bury a deer. Okay? And if you think that's weird, I'm okay with that. Because I've heard it, guys, okay? I got buddies. I have heard it. And I understand. I do understand. It seems like a weird thing to do. But when people say that, are you really going to do that? I say, yeah, let me tell you about the people who talk to us who are hurting. Let, let me tell you about the lady who called up and crying and said, maybe this sounds dumb, but since my husband died, this deer was a bright spot in my life, and I'm really grieving it. Let's talk about a segment of our community that's really hurting. And, and, and this week I was contacted by a Facebook ma uh, messenger from another pastor in our conference. And he said, are you seriously doing this? Said, yeah, I'm really, really doing this. He said, why are you doing this? So I told him that. He said, well, that all sounds good, but, and I love this question. He said, is it really dignified for a church to bury a wild animal? And my reply was, dear God, I hope not. <laughs> because I've, I've looked real careful at way he want, what he wants us to be. He wants us to be relevant. He wants us to care. He wants us to make a difference. He wants us to be compassionate. He wants, to be, wants us to be sold out to him. Never once does he say that we're supposed to be dignified. <laughs> and if we can get there, great. But I will take making a difference for, over dignity any time. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Don't hide it. Go out there and make a difference. Put my light on a stand so that my light can be reflected through you into a dark world that isn't dignified all the time. So what's that mean? Guys, wake up if you're on Sermon Glide. This is important stuff. It means we got a job to do. It means that you and I are called here on purpose for a purpose. We are not here because we got nothing better to do on Sunday morning. We're not here to make ourselves simply feel better. That's not what this is about. We are called to help God unroll the stone for a world waiting to come in. It's our job to unroll that stone. If you want to know what that means, guys, and I know I'm going late here, so I'm going to do this fast. Please pay attention to this. And if you're not a member here, if you're visiting right now, guys, you know what, I don't expect buy-in on this, but you need to know who we are and what we're about. And if you're a part of this church, I want you to know what I totally believe God has called this church uniquely to do. Here's our job description at First Methodist Church. Number one, to give glory to God and serve him everything we do. And if that sounds easy, it's not. If that sounds sort of beige, it's not. Because that means everything that we do here is directed that way. I've said this before, I don't want to offend anybody, but we're not the Kiwanis Club. God loved the Kiwanis Club, or the Lions, or whatever. They are great people who do great things because they're great people, right? That's not us. What we do is not about being good people. It's not about worthwhile projects. It's about the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and everything that we do gives glory to him. And everything we do at some point, whether it be burying a deer or, or having bears in to be able to save people's lives, is because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He said, let your light shine before men so that when they look at what you're doing, they're going to see me. So that we can be that place where people look and say, those people are weird. 
Those people are wet, but man, did you see what the difference? Did you hear about how they're feeding kids in the schools? Did you hear about what they've done for the fire department? Did you hear about what they're doing out there in the world? They're weird, but I like it. So that what God does through us will give glory to him. Number two, to serve him by serving those outside these walls. Jesus is real specific, folks. He says the most important thing that, way that we can serve him is by serving those outside those walls. Broken people, hurt people, people whose lives are messed up. Matthew 9, 12, those who have said it before, those who have well have no need of a physician. Fortunately, none of us are well, <laughs> but those who are sick. I didn't call the people who didn't need me. I came to call the people whose lives were messed up. And number three, loving and serving one another. Loving and serving one another in order to do number one and two. You know what? That love that we have, that compassion that you show for each other, that forgiveness you show for one another, that is his love in real, made real. John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples because you do good stuff. Nope. They're going to know your disciples because you say you pray right or you have the right sort, for, form of worship. Nope. It's because you love one another. Because I loved you. Because together, folks, together we can do stuff we never could do apart. Together we can be the family of Jesus Christ. Together we can tackle the mountains, we can slay the dragons because that's what God has called us to do. Together, you and me, as we fire up and live out this adventure, nothing is impossible. Because of what God does through us, in us, around us, through us, the kingdom will be built. That takes time, effort, and sacrifice. That means caring more about serving than being served. Did you notice the priorities, guys? We're number three on the list. Isn't that cool? How about that at a sporting event, right? We're number three. We're number three. That's where the fun is. That's where the adventure is. Cares more about serving than being served. It means prioritizing him and them over our needs, wants, and convenience. Not because it's easy. It's not. Man, we do hard stuff all the time around here. You guys do hard stuff around here. It's not because it's easy, because it's what we're called to do, and more importantly, it's who we're called to be. Not because we're nice, not because it's easy, but because we serve a God whose radical love rolled away the stone. And now it's our turn to invite a broken world into the party. That's who we are. If you are part of this family, that's the family that you belong to, and that's the priorities that we're going to pursue. If you're checking us out, folks, that's who this, is, this place is. And how does it begin? What's your homework? Real simple. We're out there to change the world. We're out there in the world seeing the need and meeting the need. This week, go out and find those needs. God doesn't only talk to pastors. Matter of fact, I don't think he primarily talks to pastors. Go out there and see the need in your community, in your circle of friends, in your neighborhood. See where Christ wants us to be an impact and come back and tell us. Because together with Jesus Christ, the God that rolled away the stone, anything is possible. Be our eyes. Be our heart. Come tell us, because the adventure only gets better from here. Because we have a job to do. And we have, a, we have an adventure to live out that you and me, together with Jesus Christ, can keep unrolling that stone and inviting a broken world inside. In the name of Christ, quite literally, for God's sake, let's unroll the stone, folks. Let's do it. Amen. We rise and sing. Because that stone is rolled away, he's given us that hope.
we can sing a little louder. We can raise a hallelujah. So we're going to raise a hallelujah one more time. But not just in church, guys. Out there, when the times are hard, too, we can raise a hallelujah. So let's do that. Sing a little louder. 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 lifting the stone is rolled away let's go live to invite a broken world to the party let us go forth to unroll that stone with God so that the kingdom of God may be built in the hearts and the minds of his people let's go forth to live it in the name of Christ please for God's sake let's go get them guys amen